Stephen Holcomb was a guy who had it all, an athlete at the peak of his career, on track to become the greatest bobsledder in American history, his eyes set on Olympic gold. But how he talks about this in his book, but now I see, I want you to hear this, he says, unfortunately, as the spotlight grew brighter, my ability to see got worse. My depression deepened. The pressure of keeping my secret intensified. By all rights, my career was over and I knew it. Well, Stephen was hiding a terrifying secret. A mysterious and devastating disease was robbing him of his eyesight. And here to share his, his incredible story is the author of But Now I See. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Stephen Holcomb. Thank you, oh, sir. Thank you. It's a pleasure being to be here. here. I, I got to tell you, first off, I look at the timeline. You were diagnosed in 2001. You made the Olympic team in 2002. You were the driver for the team? Right? No, no. I, um, actually, I was a push athlete from okay. 1998 to 2002. Okay. Um, I was diagnosed in 01 as a pusher. Okay. Um, I got cut from the 02 team. Um, the team I was on at that time actually went on to win a bronze medal, so it was kind of unfortunate. Okay. I like to give them a hard time because I think we had a gold medal in, it, uh, in us the whole time, and you kind of missed out on your opportunity. That's right. It kept you on the yeah, team, you'd so, have been there, right? Exactly. Okay. So um, as soon as I got cut from the team, I decided to hop into the driver's seat. I wanted my own control over my own team, my own fate. I didn't like the whole idea of, of being kind of somebody else's, uh, a part of their team, and they could do whatever they want with me. I wanted all the control, so I jumped in the driver's seat in 2002 right after the Olympics. But you jumped in the driver's seat knowing that you had a secret. I did. I, um, and actually, when I was diagnosed with keratoconus, um, you know, the doctor originally said, hey, you know, this is kind of a slow-progressing disease. You've got probably 30 to 40 years till you need to even look about it. You know, don't worry about it. You won't, you won't even notice it. Um, so I jumped in the driver's seat, started my driving career, and uh, things were going out pretty well. I went to the next four years. I made the next Olympic team, fortunately, in 06 uh, in Torino. And... Uh, Coming off of that, we had the, the, the top finish for the men's team in the Torino Olympics. We, were, we became USA 1. It was an incredible season. I was over there then. Um, <laughs> it was, uh, and it, but it ended up being kind of all of a sudden my eyes went from being you know, that whole 20 to 30 years, 30 to 40 years, you have to worry about it. It was now becoming, it's, you know, you have two or three years. And you're seeing a doctor holding his back from your coach? Sort of. Back? I mean, yeah. people knew I had bad vision. They knew mm -hmm. I wore contacts. I, mm -hmm. I, I wore glasses. They were pretty thick. And people, um, they knew I, was, I couldn't see, but they know, didn't know the, to the extent. It was always a little bit of like, oh, Holcomb's blind, haha, but, you know, he can still drive, and it's not a big deal. I wear contacts, too. And So now you, you got cut from one team. You now experience that little taste of mm -hmm. victory in the 06 Olympics, and now you're looking at getting cut not because you couldn't qualify physically, but you're getting cut because you know you're gonna go blind, you have to tell somebody this. Mm -hmm. I couldn't That's see. That's when you reached your low, did you not? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I was actually spiraling into a pretty deep depression. Um, it started around 2005, and uh, you know, things just started getting worse. I couldn't see, and uh, you know, every, about six months I was getting new contact lenses, then my eyes were getting worse, I, it was kind of a secret. Um, finally, uh, in 2007, um, after the Olympics, we just uh, had one of our most incredible seasons. Um, I won the first two-man World Cup overall title for the United States in history. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on this great roll. We're doing really well. And uh, all of a sudden, my ophthalmologist says, well, we don't actually make contact lenses strong enough. You're kind of at the end. And uh, I, my vision or my, my lenses were actually negative 18.75, which is quite a lot. Um, and that was only correcting me to about 20 60, 20, 80, so I could still get around, but it was, I was at the end and it was just gonna get worse from there. You could still get around, but 20, 60, 20, 80, I wouldn't wanna be in a car with anybody at 20, 60, 20, 80. You're driving 100 miles an hour with other guys' lives in your hands. Yeah, and actually that's kind of what came to the point where I was like, you know what, if I end up hurting somebody and I, God forbid, I kill somebody, and they find out I've been blind this whole time, I mean, it not only would it be devastating to me, but it's just, I, that's not how I want my legacy to be. Is And as you chronicled it in your book, but now I see, you said, the demon's logic prevailed. All the paths of my future led where I could not go, did not want to go. Only one path remained open. In one quick moment, I threw the pills in my mouth. By now, with the ice, a fainting memory on my numbing lips, the glass seemed superfluous as well. So I grabbed the bottle of Jack Daniels and I tipped it back, pulling a long swig to wash the little helpers down. I was intoxicated, my body was tingling. I had taken all 73 sleeping pills, sleeping pills and thought I would sleep forever. I half lay, half sat on the bed, sipping from that bottle and you slipped away. Mm -hmm. But 
there's a reason why you didn't sleep away, slip away permanently because you woke up from this, did you? I not? did, and it was, it's, it's, as I say in my book, it's my first miracle. Um, I was supposed to, and it was, it was tough. Um. Sure, no, 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 I understand. I understand. Because that tough let you know that there's a reason you're here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you had no right to do what you were mm -hmm. about to do, right? Exactly, and I end up, <clears throat> I woke up the next day, and it's not like I had some, you know, Pissing. snapped out of it, like, oh yeah, this, I'm, I'm super happy now, everything's great. I mean, it was something, it was more of a slap in the face, kind of a, you know, a kick in the butt, like, whoa, like, what did I just do? I actually hit, I hit that, that rock bottom, that low that nobody, that people talk about, but nobody actually gets to, like, I hit that. And I, I ba luckily bounced and kind of was on my way up, and I was like, I need to, you know, something, I have a greater purpose, there's something else I need to do. And that's what made you start to seek the help that ended up changing your life now forever. Didn't it did, it did. Um, I, I tell you, well, let's do this. Let me take a little break because I want to come back. When we come back, I want to be joined by the man that literally stopped you from ever thinking about taking that step again, right? Mm -hmm. Let's take a break and let's talk to him. We're going to take a break. We'll be back. We'll be joined by the doctor who actually was able to cure Stephen's blindness. Thank you, both, for sharing that. We'll be back right after this. We're back. The book is called But Now I See My Journey from Blindness to Olympic Gold. You know, a U.S. Olympic gold medalist, four-time world champion, Stephen Holcomb's extraordinary journey from blindness to Olympic gold medal could only have happened and will only happen again because of the person who's joining us now. Joining us now is Dr. Brian Boxer Wackler, who pioneered the procedure that cured you of, and i got to get this right, keratoconus. Mm -hmm. Make sure everybody knows, keratoconus. Thank you so much for being here, sir. You're also the author of the book, How We Conquered Keratoconus. Thank you. It's a real pleasure yeah, to be I, here. Fun it's talk. a tough word to say. You know that, right? Keratoconus. It took me a while in the beginning. I had little flashcards. Gotcha. Now, this was a, this was a disorder, a malady in, in the eye that until you figured out a way to do this, this was almost irreparable, correct? Really, the main treatment was the cornea transplant procedure, mm -hmm. which is invasive and painful, very long recovery. And I used to do. That was how I was trained when I went through my training years ago. So that was the standard technique that eye surgeons did for keratoconus. And did you get the same results from that as you've gotten from this new procedure? Or were the, the new procedure better than the old procedure? Well, the way the new procedure, well, it's not new anymore. It's been okay. 10 years. Sure. And uh, we named it in Stephen's honor. It's now called the Holcomb C3R. What it does is it actually strengthens the cornea because if we look at why keratoconus can be such a devastating disease is because the cornea, the outer lens of the eye, is made up of collagen fibers. And the collagen, think of them as those little structural beams that a building has to keep it stable so the cornea is nice and round. The problem with keratoconus is that those collagen fibers are weak. So they can't hold that shape anymore so it's like a hernia that's bulging out. Okay. Except this is a hernia on the surface that you look through like your car windshield. So, so therefore it's distorting the image that goes to the back of the cornea. Absolutely, okay, exactly. It. And causes all sorts of night vision problems, glare, halos, okay. multiple triple images. It, wow. It's it's like being in a fun house, but it's no fun. It's fun. Gotcha. Okay. So, so, so when you, was this something you stumbled upon? How did you figure out that this was the way to go when you, this new procedure? Well, again, 10 year old procedure. Well, there was a publication that was in one of the medical journals uh, several years before, because um, I had developed it and figured it out in 2003. But this publication that came before, it showed how this special solution with riboflavin and a special UV light can actually strengthen collagen. But it sort of fell on deaf ears, like no one in the field paid any attention to it, except me. Gotcha. And I was already interested in how we can find out various other alternatives to this painful invasive cornea transplant procedure. So with that, I worked with the team, um, including a PhD, and we actually figured out, you know, after hours, when I'm done seeing patients in my office, how we can make this thing work in a non-invasive way. And finally, there was that eureka moment where it worked. And so that was the start of how this came. So we could, for the first time in history, non-invasively stabilize keratoconus. I, I, I just, I'm shocked because this is the first time I've ever heard of this, and I don't know how how well has this been disseminated among the, the main population? Or how many people have the disease first? Well, keratoconus, the old statistic was one in 2,000. 
people. Okay. But now it's one in 500. So that's a 400 percent increase, frankly, for reasons I don't quite understand. Maybe it's better diagnostic tests doctors are doing, but it's much more common now than it was before. And so therefore people need to understand, I'm glad that Joy is going to present this because now people in America get an opportunity to understand that there is hope. You're going out for this next Olympic team? Uh, You're yeah, on it yes, now? Sir. Uh, not yet. The Olympics, uh, the Olympic team for Bob's will be decided the last week of January. And uh, actually, a uh, quick update on my book, I'm, I recently won a fifth world championship title in February. Wow, uh, they got to change the cover. Yeah, we, we got updated. <laughs> sure, so, sure. We're working on that. But you would not be able to do this next round had it not been for the surgery. Not at all. No, I mean, I got to the point where the reason I actually saw, you know, Brian was that I, I kind of went out to say, well, yeah, I've, I've been trying for, I've seen 12 different specialists, and all of them want me to get a cornea transplant. Um, and they said, well, it's an experimental procedure. It's pretty new, but we'll see what happens. I had nothing to lose. Um, and I kind of went out to say, like I told you, so I tried everything. And then sure enough, um, you know, within, within a year of actually having the, both my procedures done, uh, we won the first world championship in 50 years for the United States, and then went on to win the two years almost of the day we won the Olympic gold medal. Crazy. Is this hereditary? Is this a genetic disorder? Great. Is environmental? Great question. It's hereditary, meaning it goes from parents to children in about five or six percent of the time. Okay. So, so if your parent has it, you uh, there's not a test to see if you have it. I, can you catch it earlier? Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Yeah. There's a test called a cornea mapping or okay. cornea topography. It's just like they take a special picture of the cornea. So I always advise any parent who has keratoconus when their child is about eight or ten years old, between eight and ten, to get that cornea mapping done because if it's caught early then they could have the Holcomb C3R nip it in the bud before it progresses and gets real bad. Okay, uh, and, and how early in life do you see this where you might need a procedure? Is this something that affects children, teenagers, adults? Where is the, the prevalence of you finding out when a person has it? Our oldest, uh, our oldest patient is in their 70s and our youngest patient is uh, less than 10 years old. So we see the gamut, although it's usually considered a, a disease of younger people, mm -hmm. but we see the whole gamut. This is crazy, so now there's no, once the procedure's done, there's no restrictions or anything like that? Glasses? Or no, no, sunglasses. Sunglasses? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just to protect my eyes, so I'll try, you know, just take better care of them. I have a whole new respect, you know, and not a lot of eye rubbing anymore. So. And your vision is 2020? 2020. 2025, I think. But Can you yeah. just do something to me and hook me up so I don't have to wear glasses? No. no. I mean, okay, so this, are you married? No. Single. So ladies, you know, enjoy. <laughs> uh, you're looking to take somebody over, looking to take somebody <laughs> over to Russia with you? Huh? There you go. Uh, between now and January, there's no snow, so where do you go train? Uh, I'm actually currently in San Diego, California, at the Chula Vista Olympic Training Center. Uh, I'm just down there getting ready for this, uh, the Olympics coming up. I mean, all we can do is uh, weight lift and sprint, get strong and fast for that push start, and then uh, come October, we'll hit the ice, and, and uh, it's go time. And then January, they make the final decision, the Olympics are in... February. Yeah, so you, Feb most of February. So, it's so you're just going to get time to make the team, one month to work with the team, and then go bring home gold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it comes quick. Doc, I know you've worked with lots of, of people who have had this surgery done, but uh, for yourself, how does it feel to know that you're responsible for a guy who's getting the gold medal, who got a gold medal, because you gave him his vision back to be able to do it? It's really humbling because, you know, I, I treat each patient with the same goal that I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm here, I'm in, the, I'm in this planet to help people. Mm -hmm. That's my purpose. So to have Stephen have this experience going to the pinnacle of what he had always hoped for in his career, is, it's humbling, and, but at the same time, I'm just part of the team that's behind him. Mm -hmm. and there's lots of other people that are helping make that, res that made that responsible too, and I'm, I'm just part of the team. And you got a nation behind you, my friend, because anybody's brought home five goals already <laughs> or five world championships, or we should be pushing for number six. Cool. What do you want to say to the doctor? Um, you get a public, this is a public opportunity to tell him. Yeah, well, I mean, I, first, I mean, thank you. Um, you know, it's been a, it's, you know, saving my career and essentially my life. Um, thank you. I understand. And during the break, we had a chance to talk for a second about this whole idea. It happened. It's in your past. You made that attempt. But what do you say? There's some kids out there right now who think that they're never going to make it. They heard from somebody who said today that you're done, and they're contemplating doing what you contemplated doing. Well, I mean, there, there's always hope. Um, I learned the hard way, um, in a lucky, very lucky way. Uh, but there's always hope. You know, 
get it out, you know, to talk to people. I didn't, I kept it a secret. I kept my blindness a secret. I kept my depression a secret. Uh, when I started talking to people, that's when people, you know, that's when I found out who, who was really in my, you know, in, in behind me, who really stood in my corner. And it, there was a lot more people than I've ever imagined. And uh, just the help that I got from that support group you know, helped pull me out of that and pull me in the right direction. I met, you know, I got to meet um, Dr. Brian and, and fix my vision. I'm 2020 vision. You know, I'm running around the streets with no no contacts. Um, I have really cool contact lenses in my eye, but uh, it's it's the the opportunities are there. I just have to keep hope alive. I mean, it really. And, and as and as cliche as it says, keep hope alive, sir. You just gave probably, you know, one in every 500 people in this country some hope because some of them may not know that this procedure is even available. And you, my friend, just gave a lot of people some hope to believe that, you know, nothing's going to stop them. So, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for being here. Pleasure. Yes, sir.